longevity extending interventions, including rapamycin, acarbose, 17 alpha estradiol, canagliflozin, and calorie restriction, extend lifespan in mice anywhere from 12 to 32%. Is there a common metabolomic signature across all five longevity interventions? And if so, can we use that data to potentially improve human health and longevity? Specific triglycerides are down-regulated in all five longevity-promoting interventions, and that's what we'll see here. And apologies for the blurriness of the image. This is a screenshot from a preprint that was recently uh, posted online. And if you're interested in checking out that preprint, it'll be in the video's description. On the left, we've got levels of triglyceride 40A3, so that's 48 carbons and three double bonds. And triglycerides contain three fatty acids. For, for TG 40A3, it includes the triglyceride 14-0, which is myristic acid or myristate, 16-1, which is palmito-oleic acid, and 18-2, which is linoleic acid. Similarly, on the right, we've got TG53, 50 carbons and three double bonds, and it has the same two latter fatty acids, but the first fatty acid is different, as that's palmitate. On the y-axis, we've got the log two-fold change when compared with controls, so relative levels for each of the five interventions when compared with controls. And then each of the five interventions are color-coded on the x-axis. In terms of what's significant, we put up that black line at zero. And then we can see that for each of the five longevity-promoting interventions, levels of each of these triglyc triglycerides, 48.3 and 53, were significantly reduced. This is just an association because their levels were lower as a result of these longevity promoting interventions doesn't mean that they themselves promote longevity. Future studies would have to test if specifically reducing these two triglycerides would impact longevity. With that in mind, is reducing levels of these triglycerides related to longevity? So let's take a look at human data. And that's what we'll see here. And again, if you're interested in checking out the papers on your own, it'll be in the video's description. In this study, they looked at various metabolite groups and their association with all-cause mortality risk and longevity. And you can see that atop the list are triglycerides that had less than 56, less than or equal to 56 carbons, and less than or equal to three double bonds. So TG483 and TG53 would fall into this category as they both have less than 56 carbons and they have three double bonds. But this is a potentially wide group. It doesn't just include these two triglycerides, which were associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk and a decreased odds of reaching 85 years, which was defined as longevity in this study. Fortunately, though, we can be more specific because in the supplementary data, they looked at associations for these individual metabolites with all-cause mortality risk. So starting with the metabolites TG483 and TG53, or TAG, triacylglycerol, we can see that both were significantly associated with an increased risk of death for all causes as the hazard ratio for each is greater than one and the data in parentheses, the 95% confidence interval is completely to the right of one. So these are significant associations. More specifically, relatively higher levels of TG483 were associated with a 5% higher risk of death for all causes and an 8% higher risk of death for all causes for TG53. So can these triglycerides be tracked? It's one thing to show that these triglycerides may be important for longevity in mice, but the goal of this channel isn't just to report on longevity news, it's to potentially optimize these biomarkers so that we can maximize our own health and longevity. So first, can these triglycerides be tracked? And then second, is there a low hanging fruit in this equation? If we track total triglycerides, is that a proxy measure of levels of TG483 and TG53? In other words, if if total triglycerides are low, would we even need to measure levels of these two specific triglycerides? So step one is to measure plasma levels of TG483 and 53. And to do that, I've been using at-home metabolomics as shown here, which includes data for TG483 and 53 and more than 600 other metabolites. So if you're interested in that, discount link in the video's description. And then step two is, are total triglycerides as obtained by venipuncture correlated with TG483 and 53. And that's what we'll see here. And I should note that venipuncture is obtained by going to the lab, and then to get the plasma levels of TG483 and 53, I use a tassel device, so this is, these are plasma levels, albeit not by venipuncture. And the two tests, venipuncture and the tassel, 
are within about half an hour, maybe 45 minutes tops of each other under the same conditions. Fasted, haven't eaten or drank anything since the day before. Now we're gonna take a look at TG4083 plotted against total triglycerides as I have 14 tests from 2023 to 2025. On the y-axis, we've got plasma levels of TG4083, and on the x-axis, we've got triglycerides in milligrams per deciliter. And then we can see that they are not significantly correlated. In other words, plasma levels of triglycerides, total levels as obtained by venipuncture, are not significantly correlated, as you can see that the p-value is far away from a p-value less than 0.05 as a measure of statistical significance at 0.89. So total triglycerides as obtained by venipuncture are not significantly correlated with plasma levels of 48.3. With similar data obtained for TG53, you can see that the p-value is 0.76, which is far away from that p less than 0.05 significance threshold. So unfortunately, if the goal is to optimize and reduce plasma levels of these two triglycerides, just keeping our triglycerides low, at least for me, maybe it's different for others. I'd encourage others to track their own data to see if this may be true. At least in my case, keeping triglycerides relatively low may not be significantly correlated with lower levels of either TG4083 or TG53. But I still want to keep levels of these triglycerides low. What can I do? One thing that we can do is by looking for factors that may help keep them low. And to do that, I've calculated correlations for diet with each of these two triglycerides. So how am I doing that? Since 2015, I've weighed almost all of my food, literally almost all of my food. This is more than 99% of all food has been measured with a food scale. I then entered that data into Chronometer, pulled the Chronometer data, which is a diet tracking app. And again, discount link in the video's description if you want to use it yourself. I then pulled that data and put it into a spreadsheet. And then each blood test has a corresponding average dietary intake. And then I can look at correlations with enough tests. So that's what I've done. And in looking at that data, we'll see that niacin intake is significantly correlated with higher levels of TG4083 and TG53. And if you want to see the full list, that's in the correlations tier on Patreon. So on to the data. First, starting with TG4083 versus niacin intake. On the y-axis, we've got TG8, TG4083. And on the x-axis, we've got my average niacin intake from one test until the next. And then we can see that they are significantly correlated as that correlation coefficient is a strong correlation. Anything greater than 0.7 is considered a strong correlation at 0.86. And the p-value is far below that significance threshold of less than 0.05 at 2 times 10 to the negative 6. Similar data for TG53 versus niacin intake. Another strong correlation and a p-value that's far below that significance threshold. So in other words, relatively higher niacin intakes in my data is significantly correlated with higher levels of these two triglycerides, which are associated with reducing their levels is associated with longevity in mouse models and relatively higher levels is associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk in people. So the niacin data would be bad news. But note that there may be two outliers in both of these plots. And I say maybe outliers because this isn't a large epidemiological study where someone would qualify as an outlier for whatever reason. I intentionally increased niacin for one of these tests to about 350 milligrams per day to test the effect of nicotinic acid supplementation on NAD. So calling this an outlier may be a bit of a stretch because this was an intentional thing that I did. Whether this is an actual outlier to properly test that, I'd have to have niacin intakes 200 milligrams per day, 300 milligrams per day, a whole bunch of tests that correspond to those intakes. And then would we fill in the plot that would still stay on that trend line? So without doing that, let's take the outlier out for now and then see what the data looks like. So now we've got 18 tests as I've removed the outlier with data for TG4083 on the left and TG53 on the right. So starting on the left, we can see that they're, they're still correlated. So relatively higher niacin is correlated with higher levels of TG4083, but it's just outside of statistical significance as that p-value is 0.07. On the other hand, TG53 is a bit farther away from statistical significance as that p-value is 0.17. But also note that the data is still a positive trend line, higher niacin being correlated with higher levels of both of these two triglycerides. When considering that lower may be better based on the animal models for longevity and in the human data for risk of death for all causes, I then combined levels of 48.3 and 53 and then looked at their combined association with niacin intake. And then we can see that the p-value is just outside of significance at 0.06. So when considering these data and with the 
all tests, 19 tests, not removing the potential outlier, I think it's fair to say that niacin intake is correlated with a higher level of TG483 and 53. So it's important to mention that above about 40 milligrams per day of niacin, any time I go higher than that, it's been almost exclusively with nicotinic acid supplementation. So these data would suggest that even up to 100 milligrams per day may be bad for the plasma levels of tri these triglycerides, which again are linked with longevity in mice, in longevity promoting interventions in mice, and associated with all-cause mortality risk in people. So this would argue against, in my case, is one bit of evidence. There's other evidence, in my case, unfortunately, that even very low doses of nicotinic acid, although it raises NAD, may be bad for other biomarkers, specifically for these triglycerides that may be in longevity-related mechanisms. So this then raises the question, is low-dose supplemental nicotinic acid bad for longevity mechanisms, at least in my case? Now, to test that, for the next metabolomic test, metabolomic test number 20, I've taken nicotinic acid supplementation completely out, as it's been out for a couple of tests because of correlations with lymphocytes going in the wrong direction. So for the next test, I've added nicotinamide, 500 milligrams per day, which is the other form of niacin. Whether nicotinamide has the same effect on these two specific triglycerides, I don't know. I haven't done that experiment yet. But after the next test, we'll find out. Also, does nicotinamide by itself increase NAD? So we'll answer a couple of questions with one supplement. If you've ever wondered what's optimal for biomarkers, well, I have a new Patreon tier dedicated specifically to that. It currently includes the 35 biomarkers shown here, more than two hours of video content, 52 published references, and these aren't the reference ranges. This is what may be optimal based on how each of these biomarkers changes during aging and or their associations with risk of death for all causes. So if you're interested in that, check it out. And if you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon, where I post at least twice per day in five Patreon tiers. We've also got a whole bunch of discount and affiliate links that you can use to test yourself that help support the channel, including ultalabtest.com, which is where I get the majority of my blood tests done, the clearly filtered water filter, I use it every day, at-home metabolomics as referenced in the video, oral microbiome composition, NAD testing with Genfinity, epigenetic testing with True Diagnostic, at-home blood testing with Sockbox Health, which includes Grimage, the best epigenetic clock of epigenetic clocks, green tea, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, including data is my North Star, figuring stuff out is my drug, and the conquer aging or diet trying channel theme that I've got on here. So if you're interested in that, link in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.